No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Thanks for coming here tonight uh, to listen to Nonsense on Stilts. Uh, my name is Massimo Piliucci. I am a former evolutionary biologist. I was, I was a research biologist for 20 plus years. And then more recently I changed career and went into philosophy of science, which was a weird thing to do, uh, but it has advantages. Like I just sit and think instead of um, having to do experiments which are costly and take a lot of time and often fail. So, um, what I'm going to try to do in the next uh, half an hour, 40 minutes or so, is to give you some broad overview um, about the difference between science and pseudoscience, uh, what philosophers call the demarcation problem, uh, to uh, tell you why, try to explain why this is actually uh, not only an interesting, intrinsically interesting problem, you know, how do we make that distinction, but also why it actually is important in practice uh, and why we ought to do um, something about um, what comes out of that problem. And then finally, we'll get um, hopefully more than enough time for Q&A, which is the part that I actually enjoy the most since I've seen the, pre the presentation before. So, uh, of course, Nonsense and Stills is a title of my book, so, you know, you're more than welcome to go to Amazon at the end of this, not right now, um, and download it. All right, so we're talking about uh, the difference between science and pseudoscience. So this is really what we're talking about. It's a complex universe, as you can see, uh, that ranges from fairly uncontroversial science, uh, such as, for instance, uh, where is the uncontroversial science? It's all, it's all controversial, actually, here. Um, but something that doesn't look controversial, like uh, string theory in physics, even though the cartoon there, is, it's, it's an XKCD cartoon, it says, uh, string theory summarized, I just had an awesome idea, suppose all matter and energy is made of tiny vibrating strings, and the other one says, cool, okay, what, what, what would that imply? And the first guy says, I don't know. And that's pretty much a good summary of string theory at the moment. <laughs> The rest of what you see on the screen is something that to different degrees falls into the quasi-science, non-science, proto-science, pseudo-science, and all that. And it's a complex universe that uh, I try to make some sense of. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples in the next few minutes. First of all, let me sort of lay out the, the basic idea uh, of the demarcation problem. Uh, the difference between pseudo-science and good stuff on the other side. Uh, that guy you see over there is... Um, Karl Popper, one of the most influential philosophers of science of the 20th century, he was the one that came up with the idea that we have a demarcation problem to begin with. He also came up with a very neat, simple solution. And as, as uh, my compatriot, um, Ita uh, Italian writer um, Umberto Eco once said, uh, every complex problem has a simple, neat solution, and it's usually wrong. And sure enough, uh, Popper's solution was in fact turned out to be wrong, but we'll need to get to that point, I appreciate why, because we still learned something. So what um, Popper did was pretty, pretty logical. He said, okay, look, let's compare uh, one or two good examples, obvious examples of pseudoscience, and one or two good examples of good science, and then we'll try to figure out what the difference is. Right? So he went, he went by example. Instead of picking on astrology, uh, parapsychology, UFOs, and all that sort of stuff, there were no UFOs at the time. Well, people didn't say anything about seeing UFOs at the time. Um, he picked on Freudian psychoanalysis. And he said, look, Freud might even be right, but whatever he's saying is not science. And the reason it's not science is because it cannot be falsified. There is no way to prove, in principle, no way to prove, to disprove the, the, the theory of psychoanalysis. Why? Because it explains everything and thereby it explains pretty much nothing. It is so flexible that pretty much any human behavior, I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute, can actually fit the theory. And if that's the case, you can think of the theory of psychoanalysis as an infinitely pliable you know, mold that whatever the data is, uh, it's going to be adapting to it. As opposed to Einstein's theory of relativity, which at the time it's just, had just been spectacularly confirmed by astronomers. And Popper thought, you know, this is good science, and, and we'll see why in, in a minute. So 
why is it a psychoanalysis, Freudian psychoanalysis doesn't, doesn't work as a science? Well, because for instance, you can, you can consider the, the, these two examples of completely different human behaviors. A man that pushes a child in the water intending to drown it, and another man who jumps in risking his life to save the child. Now, you would think that the same exact theory would have a little bit of a problem explaining both behaviors because they're so antithetical, they are so different from each other. But a psychoanalyst has, a psychoanalyst has absolutely no problem in telling you that the first man suffered from the repression, the second one from sub, has achieved sublimation, and voila, the thing is solved. Except that you don't know what sublimation is. Nobody does. There's really not a good explanation of what sublimation is. Um, repression is also a very vague concept, and if you start explaining things with vague concepts, and then the concepts get vaguer and vaguer as soon as uh, the, the things to explain become more and more complex, then, according to Popper, you're doing pseudoscience. Fine. Compare that to Einstein, on the other hand. Uh, his theory of relativity was spectacularly confirmed in 1929, literally overnight. Uh, the theory made a very precise prediction that the, the uh, large gravitational masses would have to would, would bend light, uh, and if that were true, then during a total eclipse of the sun, you should be able to see stars coming up from behind the sun right before they would be visible normally if light went in a straight in a straight path. Astronomers went there, measured, did, did the photographs, and sure enough, Einstein was exactly right uh, to a very high degree of precision. Uh, theory com uh, spectacularly confirmed. Now Popper thought this one not only was a very good confirmation, but it was also a case of the theory sticking its neck out. Uh, it could have been chopped uh, very quickly, right? So if, if the data were not confirming the, the bending of the light, then Einstein would have been uh, into the, into the, relegated to the dustbin of scientific history. So that was the idea. Popper had this idea that here's how we solve the problem. The criteria is falsification. If a theory can be falsified, if a statement can be falsified in principle, it's, it's scientific. If there is no way in principle to show that something is wrong, then it's not scientific. It could still be true, but it's not scientific. Fine, except that things got immediately much more complicated. You recognize this guy, right? Um, now, Newton actually, th that apple never actually fell on Newton's head. Uh, this is a story actually that he invented uh, in a correspondence to a friend of his later on in his life to make things more dramatically, more dramatic. But, but the theory, of course, uh, was accepted, mechanical, Newtonian mechanics was accepted in physics for a couple of hundred years as the theory of how to describe the moment of, among other things, the planets. Then a funny thing happened. Um, people discovered uh, that, that there was a problem in applying Newtonian mechanics to Uranus. The planet Uranus, which is, of course, right beyond Saturn, um, was showing these anomalies constantly. You would do the calculations and say, okay, it, the planet should be over here, and you point the telescope and the, uh, the, uh, the planet was slightly off. You redid the calculations in different nights, and regularly uh, Uranus would, be, would show up at a slightly different position from what predicted by Newton. If Popper were right, astronomers were uh, supposed to abandon Newtonian mechanics because it got the position of Uranus consistently wrong. It was falsified every time that people tried it. Of course, astronomers, astronomers had absolutely no intention of uh, uh, doing away with Newtonian mechanics. What they did instead was, hey, you know, it's possible that there is another planet out there that we don't know, that it's causing the anomalies. On the basis of these anomalies, we can calculate, and using Newtonian mechanics, we can calculate the mass and the orbit of this planet, point the telescope, and see if it's there. Sure enough, uh, uh, they did the calculations. That night, they asked the astronomer who did the calculations, the mathematician who did the calculation, to look into the telescope. You, you, would you like to be the first one to see the new planet, which they were going to, uh, to name Neptune? And the guy said, no, I don't think so. I, I know I'm right. Um, <laughs> and he was. He was absolutely right. The planet was right there. Spectacular success for Newtonian mechanics. Problem for Popper, however, okay, because falsification hadn't worked. Okay. But things get even more complicated a few years later, when astronomers discovered that Mercury, planet closest to the sun, also has uh, displays a, a, a series of gravitational anomalies. So that again, you do the calculations using Newtonian mechanics. Again, the planet is slightly off, persistently slightly off, all the time. Well, astronomers by now figured out. Well, I know what happened. Um, there must be another planet this time closer to the sun, because otherwise we would have seen it before. 
And, you know, well, let's do the calculations. Let's fi figure out where the planet is, point the telescope, we'll, we'll discover. They were so sure that there was another planet closer to the sun that actually named it Vulcan, probably because a lot of them were Trekkies. <laughs> and they pointed the planet, the, the, the telescope to the planet, the planet wasn't there. Oops. Okay, well, let's redo the calculations. They, they did the calculations, tried again, the planet wasn't there. They tried for about 20 years before giving up. There is no Vulcan. The problem, in fact, is that Newton's mechanics is wrong. When you get close enough to the sun, which of course is a giant gravitational, it produces a giant gravitational field, relativistic effects become sensible enough, important enough, that they can actually be measured. And therefore, there's no way the Newtonian mechanics can actually predict the, the orbit of Mercury. You have to use general relativity to do so. So this is a situation where the same exact theory survived falsification in one case, not because it was, it was falsified, but because, in fact, the system was used, the approach was used to discover a new planet. But a few years later, in exactly the same situation, it was the theory that had to be abandoned. So clearly, falsification isn't going to do it as a criterion of demarcation between science and pseudoscience. Because sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. You know, how, do, how am I supposed to know if it works or not? As I said earlier, there's always a, a simple and neat solution to a complex problem, and it's probably wrong. So what's going on instead? Well, what's going on is that the... the that simple diagram that I showed you a minute ago where you got pseudoscience on one side and science on the other side, it's actually much more complicated. Uh, what I do in the book, I get into some, a little bit of this uh, landscape, complex landscape that I'm going to show you in a second. These two axes in, uh, now that I'm, that I'm showing you uh, are, one is a theoretical axis, how good is the theory, how complex, sophisticated, coherent, and so on and so forth. And the other one, the vertical axis, deals with how well the theory is supported by the data, because after all, we're talking about science, if it's not supported by the data. Um, so we can start at the, at the lower uh, left corner of that diagram, right? And we got theories that are really awful, they don't make any sense, and no surprise, they're not backed by the evidence. So we got astrology there, the connection between vaccine and autism, intelligent design creationism, that sort of stuff. At the opposite extreme, we have theories, on the other hand, they are very well substantiated. Both they're theoretically sophisticated and complex, and they're well substantiated by the data. So you got the standard model in physics, evolutionary biology, uh, the idea that uh, the planet is warming up, the, mole the basic theories in molecular biology. Again, notice that just because you're up there on the upper right corner, that doesn't mean you're true. It just means you're scientifically sound. It's not the same thing. Um, when I want to uh, upset my new colleagues, uh, my old colleagues, I should say, in the sciences, uh, I always bring up the, what philosophers call the, the pessimistic meta-induction, which is a fancy name to summarize the idea that every single scientific theory of the past turned out to be wrong. So what might you think that the current ones are right? Uh, so just because it's up there, it mean, doesn't necessarily mean that it's right, but it does mean that it's scientifically sound. It's, it's the best thing we got at the moment. Okay? Scientific knowledge is always provisional. This is the best stuff we got at the moment. Now, the interesting stuff, and, and that's what most of the book deals with, it's the stuff in the middle. For instance, social sciences, psychology, sociology, uh, you know, economics, and that, that sort of thing. Well, those are uh, disciplines where there is a, a huge wealth of data out there. Psychologists really have a lot of interesting things to say about the way human beings behave. They just don't happen to have a particular coherent theory about why we behave that way. There's no overarching theory in psychology. There used to be one. It was called Freudian psychoanalysis. It's actually turned out to be non-acceptable. Non the same goes for sociology. Economics is in a slightly different situation. They do have a theory, just doesn't have anything to do with the data. Um, <laughs> as we found out in the last few years. And then there are things in the middle uh, that where the theory is actually pretty good. It's the data that it's missing or not not particularly reliable. Uh, in that area, we get evolutionary psychology, which is an application of evolutionary biology to psychology, uh, scientific approaches to uh, the study of history, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Think about SETI in particular, right? The theory is pretty sound. Uh, we know a lot about uh, astrophysics. We, therefore, we know that there, are, that there should be a lot, large number of other habitable planets out there. We know a lot about biology. You know, all, the whole idea that there are other intelligences out there makes perfect sense. Now, how many data points do we have about those intelligences? Zero, right? There's only one right here on Earth. Well, depends on who you ask. Um, but so it's a, it's a science that it's, you know, makes sense, but until we find something, it's really not, it doesn't have much to say about how the world actually is. Of course, could, this could change tomorrow morning. Right? We could all wake up tomorrow morning and say, first SETI signal, 
discovered, and that will, make, that will move that thing straight up to the upper right corner. And then there is string theory. <laughs> Which is great, because string theory is incredibly sophisticated, it's mathematically very sound. Um, it's a very clever attempt at combining quantum mechanics and general relativity, which are the two most reliable scientific theories of all time. Um, and, and the problem is, of course, that string, that, I'm sorry, quantum mechanics and general relativity make different kind of predictions when applied to the same problems. So if you try to apply general relativity to very small things or to what happens inside a black hole, for instance, you get a very different result from whether you apply uh, quantum mechanics to the same problems. That's a problem. That means that either one of the two theories is wrong or both, or that they are incomplete. The idea of string theory is that they are incomplete. They're both uh, particular manifestations of a, of a uh, broader underlying theory. This is all very good and, and, and fine, except that there is not a single piece of evidence that string theory is true. Um, and physicists have been asked about this, and they said, it's coming. Just, just wait. Now, we've been waiting since 1984. And, you know, it's a good question. So, well, how much longer do I have to wait until this thing um, comes up? Uh, and the answer is, therefore, that's why string theory is down there. Should, the, however, the situation change, should the Large Hadron Collider, for instance, find in fact evidence for in favor or against string theory, then the theory would move up to the right, upper right corner. So that was to give you the idea that the landscape is, in fact, really complicated. And, and if anybody tell you that the, tells you the difference between science and pseudoscience, is, uh, you know, it's, it's obvious. That's simply not the case. It is obvious in the extreme cases. But there's a lot of interesting and complex areas in the middle, which I think makes for a lot of more fun. Now, to the second part, which is, well, why do we care about this other than, uh, you know, the intrinsic sort of intellectual uh, interest of things? I love when people use the word, it's intrinsically interesting. That means they care, <laughs> and you should too, uh, by implication. But it's, of course, not, it doesn't work that way. Um, the reason why we should care is because, in fact, nonsense kills, or at least hurts, as the slide says, um, more, more often than, than we would like to, um, to acknowledge. And so it's a social problem. So it's one of those areas where science and philosophy of science become relevant to, so, to social problems, to society. So I'm going to give you a couple of quotes. One is from an unknown, yet as, as yet un unrevealed pseudoscientist. I'll, I'll give you the name in a minute, actually. And uh, it has 100% cure for, cure rate for. Whenever you hear somebody says it works 100% of the time, your baloney detector should go at least to yellow alert, uh, because that guy is probably bullshitting him. Uh, the second is from Thomas Huxley, who was known as uh, Darwin's bulldog uh, for his strong public defense of evolution. And he said that the foundation of morality is to give up pretending to believe that for which there is no evidence and repeating unintelligible propositions about these beyond the possibilities of knowledge. What he's saying is um, we have actually an ethical duty, a moral duty to seek the truth for two reasons. First of all, because most of us think the truth is more valuable than lies intrinsically. And second, because if you don't know how the world works and you try to navigate it, you're very likely to hurt yourself. Okay. So, so in that sense, skeptics, uh, according to Huxley, have actually a moral duty to help the rest of the world figure out, and themselves, of course, figure out what's nonsense and what is sense. Now, talk about nonsense. Um, you know, just open up a newspaper, magazine, turn on the TV, you'd see all these people talking about nonsense pretty much all the time. Uh, you know, the one in the middle, of course, is uh, the middle left is uh, Jenny McCarty, and her idea is that uh, vaccines cause autism. Well, how does she know that, despite the complete and utter lack of scientific evidence? Well, she knows her son, and that's her science. No, that's your son. It's not your science. Uh, you know, I sympathize with, with um, parents who are distraught by uh, the onset of autism, but they're committing a basic, very, very uh, elementary logical fallacy, which has got the fancy name of post hoc ergo propter hoc, which is Latin for after this, therefore because of this, it's the basis of much superstition. It simply is the situation where you see two things happening one after another, and therefore you, in, you infer that the first thing caused the other. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, that is not the case. What happens in these cases is simply that uh, uh, onset of autism manifests, uh, uh, happens in, in uh, child development, usually just very close to the time which we typically vaccinate children. So you see, oh, it was vaccinated, you know, a year later or six months later, developed autistic uh, symptoms, so that's where the conclusion comes from. Uh, the one on the, on the right, um, middle right, 
is a mother who has a tattoo that says no AZT on her pregnant belly. AZT, of course, is uh, one of the most important drugs, um, antiviral drugs, antiretroviral drugs that is used to prevent uh, HIV infection that causes AIDS. These people don't believe that HIV causes AIDS. Okay. As a result, they're dying, their children are dying. I'll leave you to figure out the other two and what they said. Um, sorry? Yeah. Well, this one is over here, right? It's, uh, uh, what's his name? Bill Meyer. Bill Meyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And crazy talk. It's crazy talk. Okay, so, the <laughs> so this is uh, the pseudoscientist that I mentioned earlier. It's uh, President uh, Yaya Yame of Gambia, who cures AIDS on Thursdays and asthma on Saturdays. And presumably the rest of the time takes care of the government of, Zamb of Gambia. Um, now, how does he do that? He uses a rub down with a cream, a splash on the face with a potion, and a drink of a murky looking liquid. And his Department of Health guarantees that the cure is 100% effective. Of course, when people asked him to actually tell us you know, something about the evidence for this extraordinary claim, uh, he says, I don't have to convince anybody I can cure AIDS, and I will not explain it to those who don't want to understand. As a result, hundreds of thousands of them uh, of Gambians are in fact dying of AIDS because they uh, go to this lunatic um, and uh, trust him and trust him with his health with their health this is the bigger picture uh, the darker the areas the more people are dying of AIDS and of course this is not just the result of pseudoscience it's the result of a lot of other things but certainly one of the reasons is pseudoscience if you look at one of the darker areas is South Africa South Africa the South African government until very recently uh, denied that HIV causes um, AIDS, and therefore they refuse to distribute uh, retro uh, antiretroviral drugs uh, to their population. They were doing something similar to the, you know, they, they were producing, they, were, they licensed a banana extract uh, to cure AIDS. As I said, pseudoscience and nonsense kill people, literally in this case. Now, the question, however, is, one of evaluating claims, right? So how do I know that this guy is telling me the truth? How do I know that this guy is, is, is not uh, bullshitting me? Um, in the book, I go into some details in, in all the, the, where all the culprits are. If you have seen, uh, spoiler alert, if you have seen or read uh, Agatha Christie's uh, murder of, on the Oriental Express, you know what happens at the end, right? Everybody did it. And it's the same thing here. Uh, the responsibility goes all the way from the scientists who don't bother to get out of their ivory towers. By the way, I've never seen a campus with an ivory tower. <laughs> Just out of, for the record. But um, scientists tend not to get out of their hypothetical uh, or metaphorical ivory towers because it's not worth it. They don't get grants. They don't get promotions that way. Uh, the media tend to be a really shitty job at, at, at uh, inform, informing the, the, the public and talking to the scientists. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies will take advantage of you anytime they can. Uh, and the public itself simply does not do much of a, a job of, of informing themselves. So everybody's a culprit. But I'm going to talk about a couple of levels of, of, of problems. One is with the media. Before that, let me start with a quote from Edward R. Murrow, a highly influential journalist, uh, American journalist of the middle 20th century, who said that just because your voice reaches halfway around the world, it doesn't mean you're wiser than when it reached only to the end of the bar. And a lot of these people should, in fact, confine themselves to the end of the bar. The other one is from Groucho Marx, who said that I find television very educating. Every time somebody turns on the set, I go into the other room and read a book, <laughs> which is a good suggestion in general. Okay, now let me take on some of my colleagues in skepticism just to give you an, a, a good example. I don't want to take, a, take on very easy targets. You know, well, actually, that's not true because in five minutes I will take on a very easy target. But let me start with the difficult targets first. Uh, my um, fellow skeptics, Penn and Teller, how many people here watched Well, shit? Yes, exactly. Now, first of all, I went to Las Vegas just to see their show because it's, off, it's, it's awesome and, and it's something that it's really enjoyable. Second of all, I actually use uh, snippets from bullshit uh, often in my classes on critical thinking at the City University of New York. Of course, I have to do a lot of work to beep out um, what Penn says because um, otherwise I get in trouble with my dean. But Nonetheless, even they get it spectacularly wrong sometimes. And they get it spectacularly wrong when they get away from their expertise, or the area of expertise, which is magic after all. 
And not only that, one, as, as I show you in a, I'll show you in a minute, when they actually do things that are, uh, let's say, underlined by an agenda. There is an agenda behind it. In particular, if you go and check episode 13, season 1, which is on environmentalism, it's interesting because Penn and Teller attack the idea of human-caused global warming, but they do so by pitting oil industry lobbyists against green, against green hippies. Not a single scientist is featured in the entire episode, which right there, again, your bullshit detector should go back to yellow alert. Uh, it's not a good idea. Now, there are some priceless, for those of, of you who are, have seen or remember the episode, there are some priceless uh, bits. Uh, there's this uh, moment when they send one of their confederates, a very attractive uh, young woman, to an environmentalist rally, and she goes around asking for signatures uh, on a petition to ban a very uh, ubiquitous and very dangerous uh, chemical that it's everywhere. We breathe it, we, we eat it, and everything. It's called dihydrogen monoxide, um, otherwise known as water. But she doesn't tell them that it's water, and you see all these well-intended, you know, well-meaning well well environmentalists who just sign up on this petition because, God, my gosh, it must be really terrible to have the hydrogen monoxide in your food. But they also do things that are really not that good. Uh, the only credential academic, for instance, to be um, on the program is Bjorn Lomborg, author of the skeptical, the ironically uh, entitled skeptical environmentalist, who was actually an economist. Now, it's not that economists don't have anything to say about the debate on global warming, but they certainly don't know anything of the science. They're not atmospheric physicists. What they need to do, what they do is to bring out their expertise when, once we agree that there is a problem, uh, the solution is going to cost money, and there is many different types of solutions on the table. So an economist obviously has a very legitimate place at that, at that table. Um, but not as somebody to adjudicate whether there is global warming or not. That's uh, not his purview. It's not, you know, that's, that person doesn't know anything about that thing. I actually had to read The Skeptical Environmental. It's an awful book. Um, <laughs> although it's very weighty. It's got a, uh, something like more than a thousand uh, footnotes, which is amazing. Um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, Lomborg later on changed his mind after the episode and published another book where he said why I was wrong, global warming is actually true. This is a great way to make money. First, write something nonsensical about a, a public controversy, and then change your mind and write it again. It's, I don't know if that was intelligent design or not, but it's, it, it worked. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about that episode is that, to my surprise, one of the major commentators on that episode was Jerry Taylor, who was never introduced as anything other than an expert. And so I wonder, well, an expert about what exactly? Who is this guy? It turns out that he's a fellow at the Cato Institute. The Cato Institute is a libertarian think tank that for many years has been engaged in um, anti-global warming propaganda. Now, as it turns out, Penn and Teller are fellows of the Cato Institute. But you wouldn't know that from the, from the show. So again, there is a problem when people have connections that might slightly smell of ideological bias of one way or another, and the public doesn't actually get to know um, about them. So be careful about the media, because even credential skeptics can actually get it dramatically wrong. And we're not talking, you know, Oprah here. Fine. So that brings us to the question of, well, how do I know that somebody's talking to me and he's actually an expert, and how do I know that I can trust that person rather than another person? After all, we're not all experts in you know, climate change or, or medical research or whatever the problem is, or evolutionary biology, right? So we need to trust experts just in the same way in which if you have a problem with your brain and you need an operation, you go to a brain surgeon. You don't go to your friend and say, unless the friend is a brain surgeon, and say, hey, would you mind cutting here? Um, now, it turns out that there is a large literature on expertise. And uh, the, the following tips that, that I'm going to put in the, on the screen in a minute are um, uh, actually the result of work by a philosopher named Alvin Goldman. Before that, another quote from one of my favorite philosophers, George Carlin. I have as, as much authority as the Pope. I just don't have as many people who believe it. <laughs> and that's the problem, that there's a lot of people who actually do have authority and people don't believe them. And then there's people who actually don't have any authority and plenty of people do believe them. Uh, that's that, that's that there is a mismatch again uh, the culprit there are both the media and in fact the public itself because we you know most of us just don't care enough to yell foul when these things happen so what's the idea here well that there are several things you can do if you want to evaluate um, 
whether somebody is actually an expert or not on something. The first thing to do, of course, is to examine the arguments that are actually presented by the expert and by whoever is uh, his or her rival. But to do that, you need to actually understand the problem technically. So if you want, for instance, um, in a minute I'll show you an example, but if you want to adjudicate the debate between an evolutionary biologist and a creationist, well, uh, if you want to do it on technical grounds, you need to be uh, knowledgeable in evolutionary biology. That doesn't mean that you, have, you need to have a PhD in evolutionary biology, but it means that you have to have spent a significant amount of time reading the primary literature. I'm very, I'm fascinated by all these people who say that, that global warming is a hoax and that of course scientists are wrong and so on and so forth, and they have absolutely no idea about basic atmospheric physics. They have never seen um, the insides of one of the complex simulation programs that it takes to predict uh, the, the course of the atmosphere, uh, of the climate over the next several decades and so on and so forth. Now, if you want to say something about global warming, first show me that you actually know what you're talking about and then, and then we can have a discussion. But most of us don't have that kind of technical know-how, so what are we going to do next? Well, you can look for evidence of agreement among experts. That doesn't always work. I mean, not, none of these things I'm going to tell you, in fact, works as a, as, is foolproof. But it is a a uh, pretty good way to go because there are some genuine scientific controversies. For instance, uh, the one about string theory. There are plenty of professional physicists who disagree about the value of string theory. That's a real controversy. Uh, in evolutionary biology, biology, there is not a single biologist that I know with serious credentials who actually s seriously thinks that Darwin got it completely wrong. Um, and certainly the overwhelming majority of evolutionary biolog of biologists don't think that. Um, there, there is a difference between a public controversy and a scientific controversy. I have a colleague of mine who, who explains the difference this way. He walks into a classroom, and at the beginning of the classroom, he puts down a pitcher uh, full of water with ice floating on it. And then he asks the class, you know, how many people think that uh, when the ice melts, the, the water is going to go over the brim, and how many people think that it's going to stay at level? And about 40% say it's going to go over, and 60, 50, 60% say it's going to stay. Then he's going to give, he proceeds by ignoring the water in the pitcher and gives his talk about uh, scientific controversies. And then he turns at the end of the, of the lecture to the pitcher. Sure enough, the water stayed within the pitcher. It didn't go anywhere. The ice is gone at this point. He says, see, the fact that 40% of you thought otherwise doesn't mean that there is a scientific controversy. It just means you don't understand physics. That's the situation with a lot of the general public because, you know, the general public doesn't understand physics, doesn't understand biology, and we wouldn't actually expect them to. That's why looking at agreement among experts, it's not a bad idea. Next, you can, you can do independent, you can seek independent evidence that the expert is in fact an expert. Just because it's on somebody plays a doctor on TV, it doesn't mean that it is a doctor, right? Um, that's easy to do, especially these days of, of you know, we can Google anybody uh, in, a, in a matter of a fraction of a second. Uh, you can actually check. Now, this is something that we most of the time do as a matter of common sense. If you go to your doctor, you notice that there is, you know, diplomas on the, on the, on the walls. They are there to do this step for you. They're there to tell you, look, I'm not just making this stuff up. I actually went to medical school. And somebody thought that I was good enough to actually open... Um, up my own practice. Now, that doesn't guarantee your doctor is going to be always right. But it does, it does give you a pretty good idea that your doctor is much more likely to be right than uh, your cab mechanic, for instance, about your body. About cars, on the other hand, I will go to the mechanic. The next thing you can do is to ask questions about the possible biases that the expert might have. This is what I just did with Penn and Teller. Now, just because somebody has bias, that doesn't mean that what they're saying is false. We all have biases. If somebody says, no, I'm completely objective, I absolutely have no biases, right there you can just walk out. Okay? That's bullshit. There's no such a thing as an unbiased, objective human being. Scientists uh, somehow think that they are trained to be objective. They're not. They're trained to find faults in other people's reasoning, which is a whole different thing. Okay? Science works because, not because scientists are objective, but because other scientists have a premium in shooting down somebody else's theory. Okay. That's the way it works. It's not because they're objective. And finally, you can look at the track record of the expert. Again, this is common sense, right? So if you go and, and if you have a problem with your car and you bring it to, your, to a mechanic and the mechanic is, gives you the car back with an FD bill and then the car breaks down after two weeks and then you go back and bring it to the same mechanic and you get the same thing happening two or three times, how many times is it going to take you before figuring out that, you know, you might have a diploma as a mechanic over here, 
But the guy doesn't know what to do with, with cars. He certainly doesn't know what to do with my car. Therefore, I'm going to go to somebody else. Right? So the track record is important. Now, how do we actually do this in practice? That's where I'm going to use my easy shot. I'm going to pit myself on the left, the better looking one, to, uh, to against Michael Behe on the right. Michael Behe is a biochemist at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. He's one of the most prominent exponents, proponents of intelligent design. Uh, we had a debate uh, a couple of years ago at uh, New York University where exactly what I'm going to show you in a minute happened. Um, so let's see. How do we play the game? Again, the two players. The first thing you do is ask the about the soundness of arguments, right? So evaluate the soundness of arguments, which as I said, you can do actually only if you're an expert. There were, as it turns out, some real biologists in the audience. And clearly, I won. Um, so let's keep scoring. Score now. One to nothing. Okay. Um, then you can say, well, is there agreement with other experts? And again, the answer is hell yes in my case, hell no in Michael's case. He's one of the very few biologists. He's actually not even a biologist. He's a biochemist, which is a pretty different thing. It's like the difference between a physicist and an engineer or something like that. They're not the same thing. Uh, they're, they kind of talk about the same things, but it's not the same thing. So the overwhelming majority of practicing biologists do agree that the theory of evolution is largely correct. It's always it's self evolving. You know, we always discover new things about evolution, but the basic idea is correct. And pretty much nobody except Michael B. and a couple of other misguided souls uh, think that there is a problem. So you're keeping scores, right? Two to nothing. Is he an expert? Well, I have a PhD in evolutionary biology, one in philosophy of science, both of which are pertinent to the field. Michael has a PhD in biochemistry, which is not pertinent to the field. So he does have, he likes to say that he has plenty of, of you know, not a lot, large number of uh, publications in peer-reviewed journals, and that is in fact true. Not a single one of those publications, of course, has anything to do with evolution or creationism. They're all about biochemistry, um, which is fine, but I win. <laughs> Three to nothing. What about biases? Well, here it's a draw, right? Because I'm a secular humanist or an atheist or whatever the hell you want to call it, or like a unicornist. You know, I don't believe in unicorns. <laughs> and Michael is a, a fundamentalist practicing Catholic. The guy has 12 kids or something like that. Um, you know, you remember the Monty Python's Every Sperm is Sacred? That, that's the idea when I met Michael uh, that came to mind. Um, so I'm giving, I'm giving a draw here. Neither, neither one of us scores because, frankly, he could easily accuse me of having a, an ideological agenda just as much as I can accuse him of doing so, right? That still means we're three to nothing. <laughs> now, what about track record? I have uh, more than 100 publications in the specific field of evolutionary organismal biology. Michael has exactly zero publications in the field of evolutionary organismal biology. That's four to nothing. Now, in soccer, that's a route. If you don't understand soccer and you want to translate that into football parlance, uh, it's 28 to nothing. Just multiply by seven. Okay? When people tell you that football is more fun because they score more, bullshit. You just multiply each score by seven. Now, of course, you, you, you score more. Duh. <laughs> and of course, it's not f called, called football in every other part of the world, as you know. Um, okay. The total score is four to nothing, as I said. This, is, this should be an easy one. Okay. Uh, but it's not, because as it turns out, 55% of Americans, give or take, over the last 30 or 40 years actually believe Michael and not me, which hurts, really. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I don't take it personally. But the, pro the problem is, this is a serious problem. I mean, we have presidential candidates, you know on which side of the political <laughs> spectrum, who actually are proud, uh, election after election, to say that they actually don't believe in global warming. They don't believe in evolution, as if they actually knew anything about science at all. Zero. These are the people, the same people who, if elected, are going to have, you know, the ability to, for instance, push in the button on the nuclear weapons, which they don't understand how they work, of course, um, nor what they would do uh, if they push the button. But those are the people that are actually potentially in charge. I suspect this is a problem. It's a problem in terms of public policy. You know, Evolutionary biology doesn't have a lot of practical consequences until, of course, you realize that viruses, for instance, evolve all the time. So if you don't believe in evolution, please don't take any antiviral drugs. 
if you don't believe in evolution, please don't take any antibiotics because bacteria evolve as well. Okay, at least be coherent. Die of whatever it is that you need to die and leave the less than us alone. Oh, okay, that was harsh. <laughs> you know, as the cartoon says, you, out of the gene pool. Um, the global warming thing is even potentially more serious, of course, because this, this is really a global crisis. It's something that is happening, that we like it or not, and so whether we're going to do something about it or not, it does depend on who our leaders are. It doesn't depend on who our scientists are, because the scientists are on board. It's the leaders that are not. Okay, um, so let me, let me leave you with a couple more quotes, and then we open up to the Q&A. One is from one of my favorite uh, models on how to learn a, about the scientific investigations, that's Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you know my methods, apply them. Uh, it's true, there is a new book that's coming out in a few months before the next, just about the same time as the second Sherlock Holmes movie. It's called The Philosophy of Sherlock Holmes. It's all about inferential reasoning, science, application of logic, and that sort of stuff. Uh, if you read all of the Sherlock Holmes stories and, and novels, which I have recently in preparation for that book, um, it's a lot of fun and you actually learn a lot about how to reason. The other one is from Yogi Bear, another famous philosopher. You can observe a lot by just watching. <laughs> so thanks very much uh, for coming here tonight. We have plenty of time for Q&A. Please line up uh, on, uh, at the microphone. If we could have the lights um, on so that I can actually see who I'm talking to, it would be nice. And so also that people don't stumble into the dark. Um, to find the microphone. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Matthew, uh, I was hoping you could help me understand a little more the uh, uh, non-falsifiability of Newtonian physics that you talked about uh, and why the recognition of selective appl applicability necessarily requires falsification. It seems like it would be a more refinement and not necessarily an indictment of the entire uh, falsifiability scale. Right. Um, so the idea is this, that if you apply falsifiability as a strict criterion, which is what Popper originally proposed, I mean even Popper himself later sort of calmed down a little bit and, and modified things, but if you apply as originally intended, one instance of falsification ought to be enough to eliminate the theory. Clearly that doesn't work, because if that were the case, then you know, just discovering the anomalies, the consistently repeatable anomalies, a verifiable anomalies of Uranus orbit should have been enough to falsify internal me mechanics, and yet scientists didn't even consider that as a possibility. And in fact, it took them 20 years of unexplained anomalies with Mercury to finally realize that, yeah, maybe we should, in fact, throw away the theory. So, so straight, or sometimes philosophers call it naive falsification, is, doesn't work. What does work is, as you, you were probably suggesting, a modified version of it, and the modified version um, it's actually been worked out uh, independently by two, uh, largely by two people, uh, two influential philosophers at the early part of the 20th century. Uh, Pierre Duham, who was a physicist and interested in philosophy, and uh, W.V.O. Quine. Uh, it's called the Duham-Quine thesis, in fact. And the basic idea is that um, you don't think, uh, we should stop thinking about knowledge, uh, including scientific knowledge, as sort of an edifice that you would keep building on top uh, so that it has foundations. Because if you think of it in terms of foundation, what happens is if, if something falsifies the foundations, you, that, everything else is in trouble. According to Duhem and Quine, what, the way to think about knowledge is actually as a web of interconnected methods and uh, results, uh, you know, empirical results, and, uh, and theories. And if you think of it in terms of a web, which by the way, interestingly, uh, the major database of scientific journals available today that almost every scientist uses is called the web of knowledge. Um, interestingly. Uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice picture. What happens there, it, that if you think of it that way, then if something doesn't work, what you can do is you can start looking at which threads on the web are the more likely to be replaced. Okay, so there is a mismatch between the theory and the data. Well, is it more likely that the theory is wrong in this case, or that the, or that the data are wrong, or perhaps is one of the, the other assumptions that, are, that go into making a theory. For instance, we, we make fun uh, after the fact of the criti critics of Galileo. Right? Oh, wow, those, those, those idiots, they looked into the telescope, they saw the craters on the moon, and they still had problems. Well, they were not idiots. They actually had reasonable, a reasonable doubt. The reasonable doubt was this. 
Galileo made up the instrument. He didn't invent the telescope somebody else in, in, in Holland did, but he perfectioned the, the, the instrument. It had never been used before. We didn't know whether it was working or not, how it worked exactly. The theories of optic was, was kind of shaky at the moment. It wasn't very well worked out. So people had a reasonable doubt. They said, wait a minute, you are showing me something, but how do I know that what you're showing me is actually what you think it is? Um, because you're assuming that the instrument works, as opposed to be something that, in fact, is, is an artifact of your instrument. Now, if that sounds far-fetched, fast forward uh, you know, a couple, 150 years or so, a couple of hundred years, and you get to uh, another Italian astronomer, Schiaparelli, who discovered the channels on March, on Mars, which were, in fact, in completely illusory. They were the result of the fact that the telescope wasn't working very well. Okay? And it, but it took him 20 years to figure that out. The, the telescopes were you reached a just enough resolution to show some details on the surface of Mars, and those details looked like these straight lines, and people even published maps with the positions of the channels, and it turned out that there were not, there were no channels there. That there are channels, but they're far from, from straight, and they in fact are you know, riverbeds. So these things happen. So the idea is that a much more intelligent way of doing this thing is to always ask if there is a mismatch between theory and evidence, where is the weakest link? What is more likely to happen? So in the first case that I showed you, astronomers thought, and as it turned out reasonably so, that the weakest link was not the theory, it was the observation. There was something wrong there. There was an, uh, an assumption there that was wrong. And the assumption was that there were no other planets uh, entering into the equations. The second time, the weakest link turned out to be the theory. And so they throw it out. Okay. And uh, I guess then, yeah. just for a quick follow-up question, uh, resources for learning about this, uh, the, the web of <coughs> knowledge kind of, uh, paradigm. Um, the, the best introduction that I know is uh, an article on the Duane Quine thesis in the, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. It's online, it's available for free. It's, if you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and search for Duane Quine, D U H E M uh, Q U I N E, you'll find a wonderful article with a bunch of uh, links to other resources. Thank you. One issue that you didn't address that, I, as I sat there, I thought about was, what about the fact that the people on the, I don't know what you want to call it, but the people on the, that, you know, that don't think global warming is valid and all this, have now started to systematically try to establish, have established their own universities where they're credentialing people, they're making up journals that you know, so that they have something where they can say to the public, we're also experts, we're just as good experts as those on the, on the side that believe that there is global warming, etc. cetera. No, that's, that's true, and this is not, that's not the only area in which this is happening. Creationists pioneered this uh, a number of decades ago when they uh, started the Institute for Creation Research, which of course is an oxymoron. Um, but it's there, and it's actually got pretty good funding, you know, at the tune of several million dollars a year, because people believe in that sort of stuff and they give donations. They publish their own research, their own journal. Uh, they have people with PhDs. Uh, you know, Duane Gish is one of the major responsibilities of that uh, outlet, and he has a PhD in biochemistry. I don't know what it is with biochemists, by the way. But, um, uh, so that's one case. Uh, much more ominously, uh, just a couple of years ago, a major pharmaceutical company I wish I remembered the name because I really would have no trouble uh, denouncing them publicly because it has been done already. Anyway, these guys just set up fake journals to publish research on their own drugs. Okay, until and this this journal was published by uh, Springer Verlag, which is a major academic publisher. Okay, until somebody figured it out, wrote an expose uh, in the New York Times, and Springer Verlag said, "What? Really? They're doing this? We didn't know anything." And they plugged it, uh, you know, unplugged the, the whole thing. So, yes, these things happen all the time. Now, and so it's getting even more difficult, particularly because people come at this with a lot of money. Uh, you know, it's, it's one, of the, one of the funny things about the global warming debate is that the, the other side would tell you, oh, you just follow the money, and it surely leads to the scientists making a lot of money with their grants on, you know, atmospheric <laughs> physics. <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> First of all, atmospheric physics is so important, and it has always been, that scientists would get grants about on atmos to work on atmospheric physics no matter what, uh, because atmospheric physics includes things like, you know, hurricanes, for instance. Um, but second of all, that money doesn't go to the scientists. If you really want to follow the money, it goes to ExxonMobil, to, you know, uh, to Texaco, and to those, those kinds of BP, to those kinds of outlets. So um, there is no simple solution. I mean, what you, what you need is to rely on it, the broader scientific consensus. So just because you have 
you know, scientists would point that out. They would say, look, that, that journal is actually not peer reviewed, uh, or that journal is actually, uh, you know, way out of the mainstream. But the more this happens, the more difficult it's going to be until we call these people on, 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 their, on their task. Once that they're exposed, usually they go away because it, it becomes embarrassing, obviously embarrassing. But you need to have a, uh, a public that cares. Because if the public doesn't care, then these people will simply keep going these kind of things. And you know, the scientists by themselves, they're not a particularly powerful community, politically speaking. Uh, so the only answer I can give you there is watch out what the scientists say. And as a member of the public, get upset. Get vocal. Vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you had Guns, Germs, and Steel by mm -hmm. Jared Diamond on yes. one of your slides. Did you want to yeah. speak about where you saw that on the science, pseudoscience spectrum? Right. So that was an example of uh, that and several others, uh, other books that have come out on the same, uh, on the same line. Uh, many of the, of the more recent books are by Peter Turchin, who is actually a former colleague of mine at the University of Connecticut. He's, uh, by training, he's actually a mathematical ecologist, but he has done uh, the same kind of work that, that um, um, uh, gun still germs, still in germs, germ, whatever. That book is done. Jared Diamond, Jared Diamond is done. Uh, actually, even better because uh, Peter Turchin uses uses fairly sophisticated uh, mo uh, mathematical models with a lot of statistical data and that sort of stuff. I put it there into the lower, let's say, the middle lower quadrant of the science that has somewhat of a theory and not much of data available. <coughs> I'm honestly a little skeptical about applications of science to history because, yes, when we're, con when we're talking about broad patterns like the ones that Diamond was concerned with and like the ones that Turchin is concerned with, yeah, I, I think there's something that can be added, quite a bit of value that can be added to historical research by a, sci a scientist doing large <coughs> statistical analysis on large data sets. But, you know, it, it, most history is not like that. Most history is, you know, like more, most archaeology hinges on investigative work that is much more detailed and much more on a case-by-case -case basis. There, really, the model of the investigator a la Sherlock Holmes is much more appropriate. Yes, you can. In fact, forensic <coughs> science is a good example of that. You can make generalizations in forensic science. You can say, well, you, know, profi you can come up with profiles, you can come up with, you know, uh, it is X time more likely than uh, that the perpetrator of a domestic <coughs> abuse case is, you know, the husband than, than, an exchange, than, a, than a stranger or whatever. Uh, you can do that, but that's not going to help you necessarily in a specific case. You still have to look at the evidence for that specific case. You don't convict people on the basis of statistics. And the same goes with... Uh, with history. So there's quite a bit of room in the future, I think, for a good interaction between the scientific approach and the historical approach. I don't see science, straight science, as, a, in, in, as it's done in ecology or evolutionary biology, replacing historical research. You made a very good point on how you can pick, on how you as a scientist can pick out experts. Um, but the public is generally told who an expert is by the press and the media. Yeah. To that end, yes, the, the, you as a peer, uh, as a scientific peer can pick out expert by their peers, their credentials, their track record. How does the press and mass media typically pick out what is described as an expert outside of those they're already interviewing and suddenly scream, I'm an expert. Right. Yeah, that's a good question, especially because these days all it takes to be an expert is to have a blog. And by golly, anybody can have a blog. I can tell you I blog at rationallyspeaking.org. Um, <laughs> that was smooth, wasn't it? Um, no, you're absolutely right. Um, that's why I said the culprit, part of the culprit, is just not just the public, this is in fact the media, and frankly, the expert themselves. I know way too many colleagues that are actually called up by journalists. I'm not talking about phone news because that's really not a news outlet. <coughs> but, you know, I'm talking about New York Times, I'm talking about N NPR, I'm talking about yeah. the Washington Post, you know, that sort of thing. They call up scientists. They, you know, they look up people in universities and they ask them. And a lot of my colleagues are uh, absolutely not into talking to, to, the, to the press. They don't know how mm -hmm. to do it. It's a waste of time as far as they're concerned. Uh, they, they can't put that on their resume, okay? On their CV when they go up for tenure, the fact that, well, I, I had an interview, I was mentioned in New York Times, who cares? Um, that's not, you know, tenure committees don't really look at that sort of stuff. So there's no incentives within acad ac the academy. In fact, there are disincentives within the academy. Uh, if people start spending too much time talking to the general public, writing books for the public, 
doing lectures for the public, exactly what I'm doing here now. Uh, you know, your dean says, why are you doing this? Uh, if you do this, you have less time to publish it, another paper that only five people in the world are going to read. <laughs> Clearly, that's much more important. Um, <laughs> blame you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll blame you. I'm happy to blame you. That's fine. Okay. Um, so, so the idea is that the scientists themselves are quite a bit of, you know, the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of the problem. The other problem, of course, is you might have noticed, journalism is in crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are s serious uh, journalistic outlets, uh, for instance, and, and journalists. You know, Carl Zimmer, the New York Times, for instance, or, or mm -hmm. Scientific American. Uh, Carl writes very, very good stuff. It's very well researched. He knows who to talk to and so on and so forth. But Carl specializes in scientific journalism. And these days, newspapers, if they survive at all, um, they, one of the first things they cut out is, you know, a specialist journalist like that. I mean, sports journalism is a different matter. <laughs> Those thrive. But, but scientific journalism doesn't because, it, you know, it requires a lot of time, a lot of expertise, and it doesn't pay off, frankly. Controversy is interesting. And that's right. And then there is the problem that, <laughs> of course, controversy. And that is even major outlets are cul uh, culpable of these kind of things. You know, I mean, even on NPR, mm -hmm. uh, often, you, <coughs> you hear, oh, and let's hear the other side as if the other side made any sense. So it's um, more, not so much that they're not trying to get to the experts, it's just like, he's not answering, he's not answering, he's not answering. Okay, he's our fourth choice, but he's answering. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> hey there. More my, my question was about artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. Uh, I saw the blogging heads where you and Eliezer <laughs> Yudkowsky had a, had a discussion about this. Right. And uh, you were trying to make the point that you, it might be the case that there needed to be an organic substrate in order to have intelligence and consciousness. And Eliezer kept saying, well, that's just a matter of the kind of paper that it's written on. Right. And, of course, what I wish you'd asked him is, what if, what if it really was paper? Do you think the paper would be conscious just because the equations were written on it? So I was wondering if you'd had any more thoughts about the need for a, an organic substrate to have intelligence. Um, yeah, so this, this is a debate about the singularitarian sort of approach to things, right? The Singularity Institute, which, depending on who you're talking to, uh, they are either the prophets of the immediate future uh, or a bunch of, or a cult for nerds. Um, and if you've seen that debate, you know what I think about it. Um, now, here's the problem. So the problem of consciousness is, is, of course, a really hard one that we're just beginning to crack uh, a little bit. Uh, both philosophers of, of mind and neurobiologists have been working pretty seriously on, on this thing for, for the last several years. Artificial intelligence, if you think about it, in some sense is a spectacular success think of, you know, Deep Blue being, beating Kasparov several years ago and, and think of the fact that we can't do anything without a computer actually doing it for us these days. But on the other hand, it's a spectacular failure. Computers are stupid. They're not intelligent at all. They have a lot of processing power, they have a lot of memory, but they're not intelligent. They don't do anything at all, even remotely close to what human mind can actually do. So my, my objection to that approach is not that intelligence per se which, by the way, of course, is difficult to measure, define, and so on and so forth. And therefore, to make, uh, to make an operational concept of, out of intelligence is very difficult. It's that human intelligence is a biological, it's a process of biological evolution. Can you ab abstract, can you upload your mind to, the, to a computer, for instance, that sort of stuff? To me, that talk is incoherent. Um, because it doesn't take seriously the idea, you know, I'm a fan of Battlestar Galactica, but frankly, um, that whole idea just doesn't make any sense from a scientific perspective. Um, why? Because as you said a minute ago, you can actually, you can do the, the formalism, but just because you're doing a formalism on a different medium, that doesn't mean that the same process, processes are going to work. My example, which is actually not mine, uh, is from, by a, a famous uh, philosopher of, of mind um, and came out a few years ago, was the analogy with photosynthesis. So um, if you pick, you know, photosynthesis is, of course, what makes the world go round in some important sense because plants produce um, you know, the stuff that we breathe, essentially. Um, now, photosynthesis is a complex uh, physical chemical phenomenon. It's much simpler than thinking, uh, but it is a complex phenomenon. We understand it very well, however, right? We know all this, the reactions. We know exactly how to do it. We can even replicate it under control conditions. We can uh, cause mutations that tell us how the different bits and pieces work and so on and so forth. Now, imagine what it would mean to simulate photosynthesis in a computer. On a trivial level, what you can do is to build a simulation of the chemical reactions, which we can do. 
And we can do that very easily, as a matter of fact. And what you get out of the computer simulation of, uh, uh, of photosynthesis is something that looks a lot like the process, behaves a lot like a process. The only thing it doesn't do is produce sugar, which is a major outcome of photosynthesis. Why doesn't it produce sugar? Because the computer doesn't have a sugar production machine inside. The medium matters. We're talking biology. The medium matters. That doesn't mean that this is the only possible medium. Right? I mean, I'm certainly not going to suggest that there's something magical about being, a, 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 a being made of carbon and a few other chemical elements. I don't think there's anything magical about that. This is not an argument about you know, dualism or anything like that. In fact, if you remember, I actually accused my opponent of being a dualist. Because if you actually believe that you can decouple the physical sub substrate of consciousness and thought from the formalism, you're essentially a dualist. You essentially believe that the physical doesn't matter, that there is a separate, separate thing that is non-physical and that it's completely extractable from the physical. I think that's a tall order of, of magnitude and I don't see any reason to believe it. Could I be wrong? Of course. But it seems to me fair, fair to put the, the burden of proof on the other side and I think that in that case, uh, at least up to this point, they have abysmally failed. The other, last thing I will notice about singularitarians is that this, they, you know, they are a particular type of futurists. And futurists have, there's two things to say about futurists. First of all, they've been spectacularly wrong, almost consistently. <laughs> um, and second, they always put the crucial advance just slightly beyond their reasonable lifetime. It's only 40 or 50 years away, and you know, I'm 60, so I'm not going to see it, but I will be vindicated uh, after my, my death. Uh, really? <laughs> because if you believe that, I have a nice bridge in Brooklyn that I could like to sell you for cheap. Oh, thanks. Yep. We got uh, nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry. We are, in fact, out of time. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>